to Impact Africa, our online talk show where we get to have conversations with diverse people and organizations who are impacting lives and communities positively. And at the same time, we use the platform to celebrate people, places and events. Yes, I am Dr. Kemi Akiode Adibayo, known as Mama K. And in today's program, I've got an intelligent, smart, beautiful, hardworking, pace setter, touch bearer. I will go on and on about this young lady, Professor Shokbe Williams. She is a senior associate at Principia and also serves as professor at the Faculty of Law, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. My dear sister, Professor Shokbe, I am so glad and honored to be in the same with, room with you and to ask you and for you to share your story. So, where Thank were you. you born? Family? Just tell us life growing up. Whatever you want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Kay. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, so, my name is Shokwe Williams. I'm a professor of law at Stellenbosch University. Um, I was born in Geneva, in Switzerland. Um, um, spent the first six years of my life there, and then my family moved back to Lagos, where I'm from. Um, and then I grew up in Lagos. I went to school in Lagos. I went to Queen's College, Jabba. I went to University of Lagos, where I did my undergraduate degree. Great, Atoka! Great! <laughs> but that's Queen's College. Mm, okay. It's okay. We'll allow you. What do you guys no. call yourselves again? <laughs> We're Queens. Queens! <laughs> We're Queens. And you do look like a queen. And I love that your signature Thank you. But Okay, keep going. Tell so us. So I went to University of Lagos, mm -hmm. um, and then I went to law school in, in Abuja. We were the pioneer set at the okay. Abuja campus. Um, after my, my um, studies, in University of Lagos and law school, I moved to England. I did a master's at the London School of Economics in, in law. Um, and then after that, I started teaching. So I, I, I always knew I wanted an academic career. So my first job after my master's was at the University of Stirling, which is a small, well, let me not say that. It's a university in Scotland in a town called Stirling. I um, was there for two years. You know years. I'm from Scotland as well. Yes, I do know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know. So I spent, I spent two happy years in Scotland. Mm. Um, and then I moved to Nottingham um, in, in England. Um, and I spent a, a great part of my career there. So at Nottingham University, um, I taught law. And then I also did a, a doctorate in public procurement and anti-corruption law, which is my, my primary you know, area of research and, and that. So um, spent nine years in, in Nottingham and then in 2000, uh, I got married while I was at Nottingham, so moved to Nigeria because um, my husband was in Nigeria at the time. Um, so worked in Nigeria for, mm, I think, six years. Um, first at, at an NGO, um, okay. the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I was there for two years as head of research. Um, and then I moved to the University of Lagos, where, again, I was teaching law, so I was a a senior lecturer in law in at the University of Lagos for two years until I I was asked to join Stellenbosch University as, as an associate professor in 2016, which okay. is when I moved to South Africa. Before we yeah. go, you now <laughs> moving to South Africa in 2016. Let, let me recap there, you know, mm. so born in Switzerland and then moved to Nigeria yeah. and then, you know, I've moved as well now to South Africa. Yeah. For you going round, you know, this country. Yeah. And w w where would you even say is home? So are you, um, yeah. are you, are you from Swiss? Are you Nigeria? <laughs> are you now South African? And, you know, in terms of the culture, yeah. what stands up for you as a Nigerian? Um, so I, de I identify as a Nigerian. I, I have citizenships from other places, but I identify as a Nigerian. Um, but home is South Africa. Okay. Home is South, I mean, my, my, some of my family are in Nigeria, of course. Uh, a lot of my friends are in Nigeria. Um, and of course, I spent 12 years, I think, in total in England. So, of course, I have a lot of friends there mm. and family there. Um, and then my siblings are in the US. So, but in terms of where I feel that I belong, it, it is Cape Town. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I don't blame you. <laughs> so, we'll come back to Cape Town again now. So, for you as a Nigerian, mm. what are you mostly proud of? Okay. Um, so I'm proud of being Nigerian. I mean, of course, Nigeria has a less than stellar reputation. We all <laughs> but, know that. <laughs> but I'm proud but of being still? Nigerian. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not um, you know, it's, it's, it is not um, an accident that I'm in Nigeria. Nigeria has a lot of great things going for it. We are 
um, probably some of the most tenacious and hardworking people that you'll ever m meet. Also, some of the most joyful people. Yeah. Um, and we 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 make an impact anywhere we go. So you know, you'll hear statistics. The most highly educated groups in the U group in the U.S. is a Nigerian. The most educated people in Africa are Nigerians. Things like that. Um, so I'm proud of being Nigerian. I'm proud of I'm proud of our culture. I mean, I'm proud of our music, our food. Uh, uh, Which dress. is taking over yes. the world now. You know, so believe. there's, yeah, <laughs> in as much as we may not get a lot of things right, but we mm. do get a lot of things right. So I, yeah, I don't, um, I'm not embarrassed to be Nigerian. I tell everyone that I'm Nigerian, even if I say South Africa is my spiritual home. But yeah, being a Nigerian is awesome. <laughs> so now let's come to South Africa. So like you said, you relocated, you know, from Nigeria, then, you mm. know, here you were, Head on it, I believe. Yeah, yeah. You know, here. And you're doing this amazing work at the Stellenbosch University. Mm. For you, was it a decision at the beginning when you studied law and doing your master's to become an educator, you know, to start lecturing and, you know, what you're doing? Why? And why yeah. are you doing, you know, what you're doing? Um, so, in a way, so I, I, I had always known from when I was studying in university that I wanted to be an academic. Okay. Um, you know, I, I love learning, I love mm. research, um, and I, I love young people. <laughs> and for me, it was a way that I could use my skills to make a, to have an impact, um, especially on, you know, on young people, on next generation and things like that. So I had always enjoyed the time that I had spent teaching and tutoring while I was in university. And so I knew that I, I was good at it um, and that it was something that really had almost um, immediate returns. That is very gratifying when you do right. stuff for people, for young people, and you see how they thrive and they grow and they develop um, as a result of your, your input into them. So I knew I wanted to do that. So once I, I finished my master's, um, and I was in England at the time, and I was like, I want to you know, teach. So I started applying to universities until I got... That's right, God pleased. <laughs> That's awesome. So for you and your area of specialization, which I believe mm. is the public procurement yeah. and anti-corruption, like you said, how has the journey been, mm. especially in Africa? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. How's the journey yeah. been? Um, so it's been interesting. I was really, mm. really fortunate. Um, and and he, I mean, my research area, and I, I always say this, that it was it was divinely inspired because... When I got to Nottingham, Nottingham was, or Nottingham, you know, is in terms of the English speaking world, um, you know, a, a, it's, it's really a forerunner in terms of, of education and public procurement law. Right. Um, so I got to Nottingham and I was um, given a mentor who is, um, you know, she's retired now, but she was at the time the world's, you know, one of the world's leading experts on public procurement law. So she became my mentor and introduced me to this area and, I decided to do my, my doctorate in that area. But at the same time, while I was engaging with this woman and thinking about my, my, my doctorate um, studies, my mom had been made the head of procurements, basically in yeah. the Ministry of Defense okay. in Nigeria. So my mom was talking to me about the practical realities mm. of defense procurements. My mentor was talking to me about, you know, the legal aspects of, of public procurement. And of course, because of, you know, some of the challenges that Nigeria faces with corruption, I decided to investigates the relationships between procurement and corruption. Why is it that procurement seems to be so susceptible to corruption? What are some of the things that we can do to actually address it from a legal um, point of view? Because obviously my training is as a lawyer. So that's how I got into that space. Um, but as I said, everything conspired really to lead me into that direction, which is not something I was aware of right. during my undergrad. We don't have any subject like that at university. And even during my master's, it wasn't a subject. So it wasn't something that I had mm -hmm. known about mm -hmm. it was until i got into to Nottingham university um so the journey has been interesting of course you know when you you study corruption it, it can be very difficult when you see the impact that it has when you see um you know the fact that a, a small group of people seem to be able to take entire countries hostage and impact the livelihoods of millions by you know from from their activities so but but it, it's it's been worthwhile because i have been able to you know, to teach on it and train on it and, right. and you know, and educate and bring awareness um, to, you know, to shed light on it, um, if you like. And, and, and my work has had, um, you know, my work has, has had impact in different 
um, you know, sectors, and I and I work across different spaces. I work in the in the private sector with okay. Principia, which is a an, an organizational ethics firm that is right. based in Switzerland. So right. through that organization, we do we we address private sector ethics, if you like. Um, and then, of course, I do my teaching, my public sector education, and I do my research and writing, which, you know, speaks to governments and speaks to, you know, a wide range of stakeholders. Um, but it's hard well, work. Well, so what are some, <laughs> I, I, like you're saying there, obviously, it must be hard work. So what are some of the challenges you have have had, you know, just help name a few and how you've managed to navigate yourself? So I think, let me see, I think the... Some of the biggest challenges that I faced was actually being able to live out what I believe, right. especially when I lived in Nigeria. <laughs> so obviously my work is on anti-corruption and it's on ethics and integrity. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm studying that, I'm reading that every day. And then to now be in an environment that doesn't prioritize that can be very hard because then, then, then you've, you know, there's this you know, dissonance between what you yeah. believe and in some ways how you're forced to live or some of the decisions you have to take. So I think for me, the tension was being true to myself, mm. especially when I, because in, in some of in the organizations I worked with, both of the organizations I worked with, the university has, and also when I worked at the, 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 the Nigerian Economic Research Group, there was a lot of corruption in terms of practices and all that. And it's like, okay, so yeah, what are you going to do? Nice. Yeah, right. no, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. what I, and, and, and in fact, I lost the job at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group because I wouldn't, um, you know, <laughs> you I, yeah, the I wouldn't ball. play ball. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't play, play ball. ball exactly. So it was, yeah. yeah. So it's been that is that will I live out what I believe, mm. no matter what it costs me, I think has been the biggest challenge in and, my work. And I think that's a shame. Uh, and I'm saying this and I'm thinking about it because you could be in Nigeria now mm. doing good works, like you're making impact mm. you're still doing that i believe mm. Mm. however you know the story is yes we all end up outside you know where we're all impacting all the countries which is okay but mm. you know it's a yeah. pity that we can't yeah. you know you, when you can't play ball you end up making you mm. know serious decision that like maybe mm. you are like wow but let me go now before we close this segment for the break what are you mostly proud of you know, in terms of achievement? Because I know you're an author, you've written over 50 publications, um, you've been given awards, you go and speak in places that, wow, when I was doing my research on you, I'm like, wow, I should really be going, yeah, let me get that hand. Who are you mostly proud of and why? Oh, gosh. Um, mm. um, I'm <laughs> I'm proud of a lot of things. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms, yeah, in terms of work, I'm, I mean, I'm proud of all the work I do because I, as just as a baseline, I always do my best. So I'm always proud of the work that I do. Yeah. There's very little work that I do and I think, oh, that wasn't great because I always approach my work that I will do my best. It may not be the best, mm. but it's my best. <laughs> So I'm, I'm proud of my work. I'm, I'm proud of myself. You know, I'm proud of myself because I'm living the life that I want to live. Mm -hmm. I'm living authentically. Um, you know, I'm proud of my kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. raising good kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm raising really good kids. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm... But I'm most proud of myself right. because I've overcome a lot of challenges. I've overcome health challenges. I've overcome marriage challenges. I've overcome financial challenges, right? And I'm the older I am, the happier that I am. And you're still standing. So, I'm, I'm still, still standing. Well, standing. Sta standing in a lot of joy. <laughs> yes, and that, that is important. And I'm glad you, you, you shared that bit about the fact that you've overcome challenges, married, financial, health, yeah. which when people see you, you know, they don't see that. Yeah. And a lot of people say, oh, no, she's mm -hmm. had a good life. But mm -hmm. then you've managed to come through. Yeah. And like what you're saying, you're proud of where you are. And I mm -hmm. believe those challenges as well have made you into what you are today. Yeah. You yeah, know? no, definitely. I mean, you know, ch challenges are an aspect of character development. <laughs> Correct. You know, you, you can't develop patience if you haven't been tested with delay. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you can't 
develop resilience if you haven't had to overcome hmm. um, obstacles. You can't um, increase wealth if you haven't had to manage money. <laughs> I love right? that. I love that. I love <laughs> so, that. So, mm. yeah, it's... You know what? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, we're going over time on this segment, but we'll be right back. Wow, Professor Shepwe, I'm already so intrigued and humbled, you know, in terms of your life story, sharing the story from Geneva to... Nigeria to UK to South Africa <laughs> and then the work that you do why you know you went into academics and as well you know the challenges you've mm. managed to go through and your achievement and uh, what I know you were being very humble you know <laughs> there you know not sharing some of it but I know you've already answered this in a little way in that segment where I was asking you about value so I want to ask though what three things for you you know, do you value most in life? I, I think I already know the answer. And yeah. uh, what motivates you as a person? <laughs> um, so what my, I guess my, mm. my top value is, um, my top values are integrity, okay. um, community and joy. Mm. So those are the things that I, I prioritize. And why? the most in my life because I mean for me integrity is is an important part of being authentic of being who you are being who God created you to mm. be um, I really believe that your well-being and including your financial well-being is tied to your authenticity like being living in the gifts and the purpose that God has for you is important for you to be who he called you to be and not live a life that is and to live a life that is integrated, mm. right? So that's big for me because I don't want to be anybody else. Because if I, if I wanted, if God wanted me to be anybody else, He could have made me somebody else. Yes, but I'm not somebody else. So I have to be me and be the full expression of that me. So that's important. Community, because you know, human beings are designed to be community. Even if capitalism and the way the world, <laughs> the world system. Mm prioritizes individualism you know it i think a lot of the crisis we have with mental health challenges with autoimmune disorders with you know with violence between communities is because you know we haven't built and invested in community the way we should um so people are trying to do things on their own that we were not designed to do mm. um and joy because joy makes life. <laughs> and I can see joy written all over your face. Joy makes life. I've got joy. <laughs> joy. You know, joy mm -hmm. makes life, mm -hmm. you know, pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the absence of joy is, is awful, right? Correct. So, but joy is something that has to be intentionally curated, mm. has to be pursued, right? It doesn't just happen, like any good thing doesn't just happen. Love doesn't just happen, yeah. right? Even good health doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be, um, you know, intentionally pursued. So, and for me, you know, um, you know, having a faith that gives you the foundations of joy and peace is for mm -hmm. me, is part of being who God wants us to be as people of faith that, you know, we should be joyful. You know, Bible talks about that, counting it all joy, making sure that, you know, yeah. You keep your mind on things that are joyful, that are pleasant, that are excellent, that are of good reports. Um, so, and, you know, the world already has so much darkness. Yeah. I don't want to be part of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what keeps you going? What motivates you? What, well, what makes you get up in the morning? What makes me get up in the morning? Um, obviously, my faith is very important mm. to me. So God motivates me being the best version of me. Mm. Being a better version of me today than I was yesterday motivates me. My kids motivate me. Um, you know, obviously, I want, my, I want to le leave the world in a better place than I met it so that my kids can have a better experience of life than I met. And, that, and that's, that's not just financial and comfort, but it's like having a world where people that they will meet are, <laughs> yeah. you know, are mm. also better, hopefully, that we sow good seeds and that our kids reap a good harvest. <laughs> Um, from that so I think that motivates me um, 
and you know seeing things i know that people talk a lot about you know how terrible the world is but yeah. for me i see how many things are also really great mm. right that there's so many things that you want you can get a touch of a button mm. right some of the suffering that was mandatory mm. <laughs> growing up mm. is no longer mm necessary mm -hmm. you know you know you, you can have you know all sorts of things great health care there's access to knowledge to information and everything comes with its downsides but for me life is a lot more pleasant than i would say it was you know growing up because of scarcity and because of you know just you know some kind of stresses so I'm motivated by the fact that the world can be better. I'm motivated yeah. by the fact that God is still at work. Mm. I'm motivated by the fact that there's so much good to do and to enjoy from, from this world. Completely agree. So for you, in terms of what you've achieved, um, awards, publications, um, doing good, being happy where you are, what is your definition of success? And what does leadership mean okay. to you personally? Um, <clears throat> so my, my definition of success is being in a position where you are doing what it is you've been gifted to do, mm. right? So, and I say being in a position because some people struggle to find that position, you right. know, either because they're denied opportunities or they don't have access. Right. So being in that position where, you know what, I'm doing what it is I'm supposed to be doing um, is success. And I mean, I, I don't use financial metrics because for me, they're false. Hmm. Because, you know, um, obviously you want to live a life where you're not hungry yeah. <laughs> or yeah. homeless mm -hmm. and, and all that, um, which is, you know, of course, super important. But it's like, am I successful? Have I done what it is that I feel God wanted me to do? Have I poured out myself? into people around me you know have i succeeded in making people's lives better for me that's success um and leadership um of course leadership is service but i i would say that le leadership is making sure that you can help other people thrive hmm. so if you are any kind of leader and the people under you are struggling um even if you're meeting metrics or kpis or goals then I don't think you've been a successful leader wow. because, you know, everything we do should be people centered, should be human centric. So right. if if you're making money, but people are burnt out and are, you know, depressed and anxious because of your actions, then for me, that's you're not a you're not a good leader. You might be <laughs> an oppressor mm. <laughs> or a taskmaster, mm. but you're definitely not mm. a leader. So leadership is are the people that you are, um, you know, that are your subordinates or the people that you're leading and the people that you can influence, are they better because of you? Right. So for you, what personal qualities does a leader need to have? Because, you know, that is deep what yeah. you just said there. A leader, I would say firstly, mm. a leader has to be kind. Mm. <laughs> a leader has to have clarity. Hmm. So they need to know what it is that they are trying to achieve and how they're trying, they're going to do it. Right. So a leader cannot be like, okay, we have, maybe I'm the head of sales or whatever. I have a target to make a million dollars this, this quarter. That can't be all. The leader has to be able to know that, okay, this is my financial target. How am I going to do it? What are the resources that are available to me to do it? And what's the best way of doing it right. that the right. people around me mm. can come alongside me, thrive while we're doing it? So you have to have clarity. Um, as I said, you have to be kind. Um, you, have to, you have to be wise, okay. right? Because, of course, leadership implies that there, there are people that are around you. So you have to be, you have to be able to have wisdom in managing people. You have to have discernment, hmm. right? What can, what are these people, what do these people need? What kind of people do I need? Are these the right people around me? What do I need to shift? What do I need to change? Um, you have to be able to look at a situation and understand really what's going on right. in a situation. Um, and obviously you have to, I think goes without saying, you have to understand the, your field, <laughs> right? You should right. be, shouldn't be a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Completely agree. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> you, you have to understand your field and I assume someone is a leader that they've gotten there because they, mm. they, they're competent. Mm -hmm. You should competent. be competent, mm -hmm. um, at least in the, in the stuff that you're, you're doing. Um, and of course, you have to have integrity. Um, you have to have a, a real, like a, a strong um, ethical compass. Mm. You have to know how to, to navigate those gray areas, those gray spaces that, you know, that trip people up so easily. So, but I think that's also a part of wisdom. So I'll say, yeah, kindness, integrity, being um, ethical, um, being competent, being clear having clarity and being able to express, you know, what is in you out to, you know, to express it to the people that you're, uh, you surround yourself with. Wow, wise yeah. words. <laughs> you know what? We'll be right back. Professor Shukwe, this is a master class. Eh? We need to have this more often. I'm, I'm just learning and humbled, um, you know, by your definition of success there, what a leader should be, the qualities they should have. And for you as well, the, 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 your top value, you know, mm. integrity, um, community and joy. And like I said, I just see joy, mm. you know, written all over you. So now th for this segment, I, I want to ask you this particular question now, because you're still young, mm. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I know you will say you're no longer young, but you're young and very, you have a youthful look. I'm young adjacent. <laughs> young adjacent, I love that. In your experience today, and your journey to date, can you share some of the key life lessons, you know, that you will advise, you know, like you said, you love working with young people, a young person that will mm. say, oh, Professor Chopin Williams, I love what you're doing. What do I need to do? How do I need, not necessarily about your work in academics alone, but yeah. how that could translate to any profession. Oh, yeah, it might be somebody that wants to go become an educator because mm. we need more uh, uh, teachers mm. and academicians and so on. What are some of the key life lessons? I know it could take a whole day mm. to go. <laughs> it could compact yeah. it you know, for us. So I'll say most importantly is, is listen to yourself. Mm listen to yourself and find your own way your own path mm. um i can't remember who was this person that there's someone that says that your heart knows the way um but a lot of the time and maybe especially in, in communities of color we're taught to silence our inner voice right we teach our children to be quiet we're always mm. telling them to shut up mm. we don't allow them to we don't we don't allow them the space to hear what their own soul is saying right, right? and then we grow up and make very bad decisions because mm. we don't trust ourselves because no one has trusted us because that and that 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 um that is a skill you learn it's 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 a muscle that you exercise right, right? Okay. you will make bad decisions of course you will but if you can make them as a young person in the safe space of a family and you now, ex do you understand, you, you exercise yes, that yes, yes, decision-making yes. muscle, Correct. if you mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. listening to yourself mm -hmm. muscle. I believe that as you get older, you would have honed in on, okay, this is what is true to me. This is the right thing for me. Not necessarily with the right thing for my friends or my parents yeah. or my yeah. family, but for me. But I feel like we don't give young people that space because of mm. the way we raise, we're raised, right? So... That learning how to hear your own, your own inner voice, your own spirit, if you like, and know, you know, what you're supposed to do, knowing the path, knowing what actually makes you come alive. Right. Because what makes you come alive may not be what makes your sister, even your twin sister, come alive. But if you've been, you've been this group heard or this group think mentality, mm. you might look as a young person, okay, that person is, wants to be a lawyer, that person wants to be a doctor, that looks good. 
but it might not be what your own soul (laughs) yeah correct where your own Mm -hmm. soul is leading you it's not the imprint that god has put on you so i think finding that and that is hard work especially if you haven't had that training you know as as a young person it's like that what listen to yourself listen to pay attention to yourself <clears throat> and it's an aspect of getting to know yourself where where am i most alive what's right. the thing that ignites a spark in me what are mm. where when because as, as young people there are things that you do they think i am in flow i feel better yes. about myself when i do this particular thing than that of course we there's still hard things we have to do that we may not like but there will be that thing that you know anytime i do this i am my truest self Mm. you know and so it's that find your own voice find yourself because your soul knows the way you know god has already deposited everything in us Mm -hmm. and it's for us to work it out Mm. but of course you know (coughs) families or society tries to (laughs) suppress that thing yeah (laughs) because struggle is real in that aspect (laughs) suppress you pull you down society needs Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Dull people to mm. for society to function mm. for for systems of oppression to work. You need people who can't be themselves, right? Yeah. Who are yeah. yeah. So I'll say find that, find that. Okay. Um, you know, find yourself, find what makes you come alive. Know yourself. Um, and I would I would also say that be very very intentional about your life. Um, again. You know, systems of oppression, whether those are patriarchal systems or, or white supremacy systems or capitalist systems, you know, they, they, you know, they function on, 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 the, on the idea of oppression, right? Um, so you, you have to, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, you, you, you have to make sure that you you know, you are true to yourself sure. and that mm-hmm. you use your own voice, right. use your own power. Be very intentional about your own life hmm. because no one is coming to save you. Mm-mm. No one is going to help Mm-mm. you Mm-mm. have the life you want. Yeah. <laughs> you, no, have to create nobody, you have to create it. You have to walk Yeah, you have to yourself. create it. And, and, mm. and that means that you have to be clear in your mind first about who you are, about what makes mm. you come alive and about what you want. Like, what kind of experiences do you want? And those things, many people think that um, those things are a function of or finances or resources. And they are, but they're not. Because without intention, even if you have resources, you wouldn't know what yeah, to, to do. You mm-hmm, won't have a plan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you understand? Yes. And, you know, and they talk about, you, you, you have heard statistics of people who win the lottery within five years are worse off after winning millions yeah. and you think how can that be <laughs> but there was no intention for that yeah, money yeah, because that money yeah. came and then it, oof, it, and it went that, do you understand so it's like be intentional about your life mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the more intentional that you can be the more you will see that life you know f- fulfilling people quote the scripture a lot that if you write down the vision and make it plain there are different ways that people interpret it that either an angel will run with it or an herald will run with it but if you write down and you, are, you have clarity about yourself and you put intention behind it, sometimes you will look back and you think, I don't even know how that happened, hmm. but it did because I was intentional. Hmm. But because, as I said, the systems of oppression need people not to be intentional, need people not to be clear, right. need people not to have a plan. Right. right. Because if you have a plan, that means you can't follow the oppressive system's plan <laughs> yeah. for you. Um, so even our education system squeezes that intentionality out of kids that creativity that idea of no i want to forge my own path mm, mm. um so i'll see so, so, know so yourself be intentional th- that's a lot of packed there mm. and you know like you're saying now in terms of the education system you know squeeze that out of mm. you know our kids and so on but i want to now go on to kind of like my final question because okay. i know we're running out of time now yeah, yeah. um what social issues for you means a lot you know you mentioned gender-based violence Mm. earlier on you just in passing you Mm. mentioned um um even your work you know in terms of anti-corruption and and so on um they're all issues you know that needs to be addressed so but for you 
what other issues apart from what you're doing mm. means a lot to you and what what are the solutions yeah. you know to it just you know briefly okay. if you have yeah. the opportunity i know um. i know it's a, it's a big question i'm asking there but you know for so, either for south africa yeah. for nigeria or for any part of africa so i so i'll say that in terms of issues i i'm not um there isn't a like i won't say there's a particular issue that is important to me what what is what is what are important to me are the systems okay. that create those issues right and hmm. for me the two main ones or really the three main ones are patriarchy hmm. they are white supremacy hmm. and and capitalism and they're right. all mutually reinforcing right so white supremacy is the grandfather if you like of racism Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and all the issues that come mm -hmm. from that which is you know black poverty black crime black mm -hmm. unemployment mm -hmm. right so if you look at poverty in south africa and you don't look at it through the prism of white supremacy then you're not at, right john then you're, you're mm -hmm. dealing with a toddler when the grandfather mm -hmm. is still mm -hmm. in, in charge this is deep. Yeah. so that's mm -hmm. it um and then of course patriarchy is, is a system that mm -hmm. you know that emphasizes the um or that that you know that em em that emphasizes the importance of men to the detriment of women and so if you look at things like femicide gender-based violence sexual violence the the sexism right and everything that comes from that the system that makes that possible is patriarchy hmm. so gender-based violence is not an issue an isolated issue it's like what right. is the system that right. makes right. gender-based violence possible um, and then if you look at, um, if you look at, 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 at capitalism, the idea that, you know, what is important, what the, the main value is financial resource yeah. to the detriment of humanity, then you think about things again, like when you have things like, like, um, 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 like poverty, even poverty among people, people who have to do three jobs before they can have a basic... Now you think there's something mm -hmm. wrong with mm -hmm. that system mm -hmm. that no matter how much you but work, you don't have access so, to yeah. resources. Yes, yes, but then there are yes. some people that, you know, who Sit own... Don't even need to go anywhere. And are, are generating millions. So it's like, I remember um, one of the... Um, um, Alexandria uh, Cortez, uh, she, she's a U US lawmaker, and she said... No one makes a billion dollars. You take a hmm. billion dollars, right? So there are systems that ensure that white men, especially, again, working with white supremacy, are able to control the productive assets of the entire world. Hmm. And people of color are always at the bottom of the, of the financial food chain. So again, you see white supremacy is working with patriarchy, is working with capitalism, capitalism. to keep certain things the way they are so that you find that no matter what some countries do if you look at african countries african countries own most of the mineral wealth and resources but they're the poorest, poorest. but when you understand is, that yeah. white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism are have been designed in a way to keep countries of that. color in a particular mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. that you know that no matter what they do <laughs> it's like they're like a, it's like yeah it's like yeah. A, a, a a a rat on a ferris mm -hmm. wheel like nothing really changes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for me it's those systems that i'm interested in like, how do we dismantle those so systems what are the solutions? <laughs> that you've got brought a different perspective <laughs> for me <laughs> this one think, so what are the solutions what, how do we address this so that so, generations okay so come so let me so i'll keep talking yeah, about, about it so i'll say that um I'll say that African leaders mm. and African people hold the key to dismantling many of these systems. Mm. So Africa is, has bought into white supremacy, mm. all African countries. So a country like South Africa will bend itself backwards in trying to attract foreign direct investment, even though the amount of money that is taking out through schemes like transfer pricing, um, like tax evasion by multinationals is m 
mm, multiples more, more than FDI. Mm. But we bought into this idea mm. that if we don't have white money, right, mm. we don't have money coming from North America and Western Europe, we're not going to develop, even though we are propping up <laughs> those economies. So mm. I feel like until African leaders really understand mm. that this system that they've bought into is designed to ensure that those countries can never develop. There's nothing they can do. Even if FDI tripled, quadrupled, mm. nothing will change, change because the amount that is leaving is far in excess of what is coming, in. Is coming, is coming into Africa. So if African leaders can <laughs> wean themselves mm. off those ideas and mm. really form a new paradigm like China did, Hmm. Right. I mean, China developed because China, China was sold the same lies that Africa right. was that right. if you um, if you focus on your comparative advantage and keep producing rice, you will be wealthy. And China was like, nobody has been wealthy from selling <laughs> rice. <laughs> the countries that are wealthy are making something. Mm. So I'm mm. going to make stuff. <laughs> and now you, you can't own anything. Yeah. You can't yes. even own underwear. Yes. without there being a Chinese mm -hmm. component mm -hmm. to it. You literally cannot have an underwear, mm -hmm. right? But African countries are like, no, keep producing cocoa and cassava. You'll be rich one day. Hmm. And we're like, yeah, so we don't add any value to anything. And so we can never be rich because the commodities, even minerals, their price in their raw form is peanuts mm. and even that price is not di dictated by the african countries by the way so i think once african leaders borrow themselves a brain as we say in nigeria yeah. and understand that the economic system that you are a part of will never work for you because it's based on a lie it's mm. based on white supremacy it's based on patriarchy it's based on keeping the status quo as it is because africa right now exists to ensure that the standard of living in North America and in Europe is high while their cost of living is low. And so because of that, we have a high cost of living, but a low standard of living. So without us breaking out of that, so that solution is in the people that we have. Enough. Yeah. It's in every one of us. And until we understand that and recognize that and take painful but necessary steps hmm. those problems are not going away it doesn't matter what intervention you have those problems are not going away wow 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 i'm sure you probably can hear the gardener outside it's a beautiful day in <laughs> south africa so we're taking the opportunity <laughs> to get the gardens done but hopefully you can still hear us ah uh, my dear professor shokwe that is deep you brought a different perspective for me that I haven't heard. No wonder you excel, <laughs> you know, what you're doing. We we celebrate you, we honor you, we see you, Thank we you. appreciate you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank and you, you Mama are Kate. leaving a legacy that even you goes beyond what you know. I hope so. And God that has been guiding you, like you said, divinely will continue to guide you and to lead you to you know, mentor others, to bring others up because you're already doing that. I know we didn't even see some of that, but thank you, you know, thank for you. all the work you're doing. Thank you for impacting lives positively. Thank you, Mama Kate. Thank you. In closing, I would, I know there's a lot we said there, but I still want you in closing to give words of encouragement to anyone you want to speak to, but I want you to look directly to speak to them uh young people um corporate anyone you want to speak to i don't know if you could just give words of encouragement okay um so i'll, I'll say to young people i'll say that um there are a lot of challenges but life can really really be can life can work for you life can be beautiful for you but you have to make sure that you desire it and mm. you are ready to work for it and you're ready to listen to your own heart. Um, so there are challenges and there are barriers and obstacles, but they are not beyond you overcoming them to be the person that God has called you to do, to be rather. 
and it is possible and really I'll say as the Bible says everything is possible to those who believe mm. <laughs> thank you Professor Shockman Williams for all you do like I said listen to yourself life can work for you but you have to desire it there's a lot you said there and that's all we've got time for but i can't wait to come back to you know not just share a story but to go deeper into some solutions to some of what we spoke about because i want to learn more i want to hear more and knowledge is power so can't wait to do that so thank you again and thank you. uh that's all we've got time for. Till next time, stay safe, stay blessed. This is Mama K saying, God is love.